so Cassandra, you know, thanks so much for taking the time to, to join us today. Um, the first question I wanted to ask is um, how are ge geopolitical uncertainties um, and a rather sluggish global growth backdrop affecting uh, IPO markets? Sure, Joan. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me and uh, hi everyone. For those I've met, good to see you again. Those I've not met, nice to meet you. Um, Cassandra Sire, Head of International Capital Markets at NYSE. My team and I take uh, new companies from outside of the United States to list at the NYSE. So for that, just a little bit of a background. Um, in terms of geopolitical uncertainty and impact on IPO market this year, you may be surprised to hear it hasn't impacted the IPO market that much this year. In fact, we're off to a really strong start in the U.S., and when I look at January to April this year of new IPO proceeds raised globally, we're off to the fastest momentum if you strip out 2021. 2021, don't have to go into too much details there, it was an outlier year, 0% interest rate. Um, but if you strip that out, we're at the fastest pace in IPO proceeds this year since 2018. And if you only look at U.S. IPO proceeds of the same time period, it is the fastest pace since 2015. So with that question, really, it hasn't impacted the IPO market too much. In fact, at the NYSE, we have seen four out of five largest U.S. proceeds this year. Armor Sport, which is a Helsinki brand, and uh, that was $1.4 billion raised on February 1st. And Reddit, which was a tech company that a lot of people were looking at, UL Solutions, $1 billion raised. Rubrik, yesterday, $750 million raised. So that just really gives you a sense of how you know, robust the IPO market is so far this year. And in my role, you know, we speak to companies a lot of times before they are ready for IPO. And I can tell you there are several companies right now globally that are actually speaking to investors now, testing the water now, and getting ready to launch in a few weeks. So this year has been really, really robust on the IPO side. Great. So, yeah, more optimistic then. 100%. Looking, looking ahead of 2024. <laughs> yes. Um, how important and consequential are the international listings at the New York Stock Exchange? Um, you know, can you tell us just a little bit more about that and about how the current macroeconomic environment globally is affecting your role um, at the yeah. Stock Exchange in attracting new foreign issuers? Uh, absolutely. Um, I think international capital markets is really, really important. And at the NYSE, again, just for background, we have 2,400 companies listed and more than 25% is international companies. So it's a big amount of company. More than 530 companies are listed on the NYSE that are from an international heritage. Um, and why is it important? Because, you, you know, U.S. has the deepest liquidity in the world. Right now, it's pretty much undisputed. And it has the broadest range of investor base. Additionally, the U.S. just has such a strong governance that it really helps companies that are listed here raise capital they need to bring back to their country where they do their business and continue to invest in the economic environment there. So I would say internationally, we're, we're really, really excited about what's happening as well as the fact that the companies that have come out from non-US and US have done well this year. So it's giving a lot more investor confidence to investing in a new IPO deal, as well as companies that are listed elsewhere already, but are adding a US listing. So a lot of times you hear the word dual listing, and dual listing is a very, very big trend and has been a really strong momentum since the last 12 months and will continue to do so in the next few months. And what I'm talking about is companies that are already publicly traded elsewhere, such as in LATAM, in you know, Brazil, Mexico, uh, in Asia, uh, whether it's Hong Kong or Singapore or Australia, 
uh, as well as in Europe, London Stock Exchange, Europe, we see, you know, very recently, I'm, in fact, I'm welcoming uh, companies from Oslo listed that are listing in the US uh, very soon. So there are really strong momentum in dual listing, and we're really excited that they're coming to the US to raise the capital they need to help raise, to bring it back to their international land. Yeah, so just to pursue this, so what are the advantages of listing on the New York Stock Exchange sure. compared with listing elsewhere? Yeah, you know, I think simplifying uh, for this audience, I would say the first thing is um, the New York Stock Exchange has the best marketing and visibility uh, platform that we can offer to companies. And what I mean by that is companies that are listing on our platform, a lot of times, as I mentioned earlier, we engage them much, 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 you know, before the IPO. And what we do is we gave, give them a stage to tell their story. It could be through interviews such as this. It could be through uh, billboards. It could be through various ways for us to really help them amplify their story. Uh, so marketing and visibility. And number two is trading our exchange trades differently versus anywhere else in the world. And that is the case uh, versus any, you know, U.S. exchange or international exchange. It is uh, coupled with a human trader as well as state-of-the-art technology. That extra layer of human oversight helps smooth out the intraday volatility of our stock. So our stock tends to trade better and tighter, not just on IPO day, which is very important how you debut, but also the rest of uh, you know, the listing of that particular stock. And then thirdly is the tools and services. We really believe in empowering our companies with the best tools and services. And those we offer to them a lot of times uh, for free for a period of time. Um, and that really helps them get themselves ready to be a publicly traded company uh, in the United States. That could be Sabine's Oxley requirement, there could be you know, investor call requirement, et cetera, ESG disclosure. All of these things are built into our tools and services bundle for, for our companies. Thanks, Cassandra. Um, since 2021, tech has been the most dynamic sector in terms of IPO proceeds. And I think healthcare and finance come quite a ways behind uh, or some way behind. Do you expect that to continue in 2024 and beyond? Yeah, so I'll just say that, you know, as I mentioned earlier, um, some of the larger names that have happened this year in IPO proceeds are actually in the tech sector. So Reddit, Rubrik, and Ibotta. These are just some of the big tech names that have come out of late, and they have done well. Uh, but beyond tech in 2024, we're actually seeing really, really, really healthy types of companies coming in and they are across various sectors and across various countries so again yes tech we're excited about because it's finally actually you know thawing uh, and we see that the tech ipo market is open but we also see a lot of activities coming from other sectors as well great um so things are looking looking up yes to be the case of 2024 <laughs> but still you know, the market seems to be characterized by a kind of mixture of some optimism, but also still some caution. So what are investors really looking for from issuers and how should prospective issuers handle these kind of more volatile or uncertain times? Maybe that's the... Yeah, absolutely, Joan. Um, and I think this is something that at any point in time, any investor will always pick whatever is the best risk return profile for their portfolio. Mm. And every investor has a different profile. So what companies need to think about in order to attract the capital they require is how are they positioned versus their competitors, versus their healthy peer group. Um, so I think what investors are looking for are companies that are well-managed, strong management team, really, really high governance, great board of directors, hopefully board of directors that have taken other companies public before and have the expertise around that, strong financials, strong balance sheet, predictable future cash flows. A lot of times investors have a lot of options these days when interest rate is not zero, right? We finally have the ability for investors to express it, whether it's through equity, bond, commodities, et cetera. So how do they pick the best type of investment for their money? 
it, it really depends on how a company is positioned to help capture those investor appetite. And the ones that have gone out so far this year uh, in the IPO market have traded well. When I'm not talking just IPO day, I'm talking 30 days after, 60 days after. Because of that, it really helps instill more investor confidence to invest in other IPO deals. And there's a lot of dry powder sitting on the sideline, right? There's a lot of investors that are looking to invest, but they're trying to find the right trade. How do you make sure that that right trade is your issuance? Great. Well, that's all we've got time for. But Cassandra, I'd really like to thank you for coming here, sharing your perspective, um, you know, which is very valuable thank for you. people in this room and um, your insights and, and so your advice uh, too. So uh, let's have a photo and we're going to please stay in your seats. We're carrying on the conversation for the next session.